I'm really excited about Daniel's work for two reasons. First, he talks about it sort of in this personal context. And software development is an act of, of culture. It's an act of personal. It's something we do together. And I love the social aspects of it. So I'm excited about that. The other thing is vertical search is hard and weird. We think of search as being solved. And uh, maybe web search is semi-solved. It feels like it gets worse and worse every day. Is that a coughing in the background disagreeing? Excellent. Yes, exactly. So web search isn't solved either. But vertical search is one of these weird, interesting spaces. And I love people talking about it because it's very different and it's very niche. And uh, we're obsessed with it at Etsy. So you want to come on up? Without further ado, Daniel Tunkley. Daniel Mumble Mumble. I can't I do karaoke, but yeah, okay. <laughs> you were projecting amazingly. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll tone it down a bit now. Um, but um, you know, what I'd worked on before going to search were somewhat different things. I'd worked on network visualization, and it, it, now you're a little bit showing my age here. I was working on this from 1993 to 1998. Now back then. When people said networks of interest, they meant semantic networks. I mean, there was this esoteric field of social networks from sociology, uh, karate clubs in schools, or maybe observations of when people worked that they tended to be more interacting more with the people next to them. But you know, as an academic, there was obviously no practical value to it, uh, let alone a nascent industry. I can't remember. Friendster probably started at the very tail end of uh, one of my time in school. Um, well, you know, made pretty pictures. Uh, networking is off, uh, networks in terms of optimization. Um, and uh, I did touch on information retrieval. I tried to think of reformulating queries as a problem that you might be able to do better if you could see the semantic relationships among query terms you might use, explore that, and then use that to refine your queries. You might think, why the hell would anyone do that? But this is back in the mid-90s when people paid to do searches. Uh, like, I don't know if anybody here can even remember an era like this where you didn't go to a search engine, sort of hit a you know, do your query, get back results, yay. 
No, you went to a service where, like, uh, Giga, or, okay, at least somebody here remembers this. Legal professionals would be doing this. They might get subscriptions, but some people were actually paying by the document. So the last thing you wanted to do was do some massive search where you get a huge amount back. But at IBM, they had this idea that they would do some summarization on top of the collection, you know, get, get something you could then explore and do better queries. Never saw the light of day, as you might imagine, us doing this in the mid-90s. And that was kind of when uh, web search was coming into the fore. And now that whole thing is a relic of times past. But uh, you know, I got to, to, to see what people were doing with information extraction in order to generate these semantic graphs. And it was my first taste there. Also, I had these uh, fun ideas around uh, shared ride transportation. And this is the kind of stuff I was thinking about. But then, in 1999, I got recruited into this company whose idea was to make better search for eBay. And next thing I knew, I found myself actually learning about information retrieval, learning about search. Uh, and in terms of this, this picture here, it's probably doing most of my work in this, this serving engine uh, that, uh, called the Index. Uh, you know, my friend Josh Capel is in the audience here. If you remember some of the early days at, at Indeca, uh, trying to enable search on t initially e-commerce sites, but then increasingly any collections of semi-structured data. And the next thing I knew, I'm a search guy. Like people actually think I know something about search, despite having no credentials uh, to, to do so. So. What I'd like to spend the next you know, minutes talking with you guys about is what I've learned, what I think is still really lagging in sort of the academic treatment of search, and in many cases, what people are doing in industry when they try to solve search problems. And I think you know, if uh, you only remember one thing from this talk, it's that search is not a ranking problem. And I mean, Kellen talked about you know, vertical search being different. I actually think this is even true for web search. That fundamentally, search is a communication problem. And what I mean by that is if you think of a ranking problem, you could think of it as I do a search that's encapsulated in some object that's sent to an engine, which then scores documents relative to that object. And its job is simply ranking. You, know, you can pick your, your metaphor of choice, but it's you know, some scoring, some ordering. Give me the stuff back. Um, that may be the way that if you're an academic working in information retrieval, a task is defined for you. It is, in fact, the way that many search engines work. But it is not what end users experience. What they experience is, I have an information need, and this dumb machine just doesn't get it. And I've got to, in some mechanism, communicate that information need to the machine and get it across, maybe in one shot, Maybe in a series of interactions, it might be nice if the machine communicated back to me so I got that it understood what I was asking for. And that problem is quite different than ranking. So I'm going to talk about sort of three bundles of what I've seen as search as communication. The first is going to be a bit of a journey into the librarian's uh, approach to search. And librarians are a, a bit, uh, uh, you know, they, see, they seem like they're from another era now. Uh, you know, we have libraries, you know, people go to them, they hardly are, are looking at books. In many cases, they're going there to, to use the, the free internet access. But uh, there's a lot that we can learn on the search side from what people have done in library science. Um, and uh, I'll share some of the lessons there. Next, I'll talk about. You know, my, my adventures with information extraction, because I think I've picked up a few things there that strike me as common sense, but whenever I talk to people about them, they seem surprised. So I'm hoping, at the very least, if people don't know them before this talk, they are familiar with them afterwards, and you know, the, this uh, whatever nuggets of wisdom here start to spread. And last, uh, I have what, what I call the sort of a moment of clarity, and I'll save a description of that for when I get to it. So let's talk a little bit about library science. Right? You know, the uh, librarian is really just you know, a search engine with a heart. 
a powerful search engine. So uh, as any of you who read the sort of the, the Google blog post on Pigeon Rank know, this is roughly how search engines work. Right? You send in your query. Your query then you know, gets uh, scored by a bunch of pigeons that are specifically trained to do feature extraction. And, and you know, some of them are looking for topical features like TFIDF, and some of them for authority ones like PageRank. They peck a bit. You, know, you get a vector back. In any case, you, you score it. Yeah? Sorry, so TFIDF is, is, uh, stands for term frequency multiplied by inverse document frequency, which uh, for the, the non-information retrieval folks is term frequencies, sort of the terms in your query, how often they're occurring in a document. They have to typically occur at least once each in order to have the document qualify. And typically the, you actually normalize by the length of the document so that you get more credit for the words occurring as many times as possible, but in a small document. If that sounds like it's incenting keyword stuffing, it's because it does. This is why uh, uh, other features came into play. Inverse document frequency says that a term that occurs in fewer documents is more specific, therefore more interesting, than a term that occurs in large numbers of documents. Stop words are the extreme of having a very low inverse document frequency. Uh, yeah, and this is, this is typically logarithmic uh, uh, for the same reasons you don't want, uh, if you make these things linear, they tend not to work so well. So this is, uh, TFIDF is kind of the foundation, uh, sort of foundational result that before spamming and all sorts of practices that you started seeing in web search became prevalent, this was the sort of main way people thought about topical relevance and information retrieval variants of TFIDF. Uh, and uh, this is actually um, uh, Karen uh, Spark Jones, uh, who died a few years ago, and Stephen Robertson were kind of the pioneers of this, this area. Now, this is the way search used to be. Right? For, for many of the things we think of as information seeking processes, we would ask a librarian. And there's, there's an entire school of thought around what they called reference interviews in terms of the dialogues with librarians. Uh, by the way, th this may seem extremely old school. But it's still the case that a lot of problems get solved by talking to people. I mean, there were companies like Aardvark that got acquired by Google that their entire premise was that rather than look it up yourself, you'd ask someone who knew. There were also parodies like, I'll Google that for you. Um, but uh, a lot of the promise of social search is that rather than you know, ask the engine, you ask a person. Now, there's a lot of nuance there about asking the right person, being routed to experts, maybe just having the recommendations sent to you in the first place. But you know, we shouldn't dismiss the, this, uh, this notion that maybe people can add something to the process that uh, our algorithms aren't doing. Uh, you know, we encapsulate a lot of, of interesting uh, knowledge and computation in you know, this the little gray matter there. And you know, I talked about search being more than a ranking problem. Actually, information seeking, which is the sort of broader network, is much more than just the retrieval part of the process that people typically think of as search. Uh, you know, folks like Stuart Card and Peter Paroli had this theory of information foraging. And there they model this on the way that I think it was ants look for food, and they have this whole exploration process, and they're kind of looking in these, these areas for these, and they are looking for trails where that information might be. And of course, we're not quite ants, and we do more than that. We put this all together to make sense of it. The point I'm after here is that there is a lot more that we typically are doing than, than retrieval. So the, the question is, what can search engines do to facilitate this process? And be more conversational, be more, uh, you know, communicate with us on the way. So the first thing is that, you know, rather than assume they'll get it right, recognize the possibility of ambiguity, better yet, recognize the ambiguity itself, and engage users to ask for clarification. That's one of my favorite examples of this because it's really a David versus Goliath. Uh, and by coincidence, the initials work that way. Our, you know, Google's our Goliath here. I do a search for NLP. I'd like to believe that in this room, 
people probably guess I'm looking for natural language processing rather than neurolinguistic programming. You could argue which is, which is the science and which is the pseudoscience, but the, um, uh, you know, Google goes with the modal neurolinguistic one. That is what most people look for. Now you could say, well, I, why didn't I sign in? It doesn't do that much better there unless I've looked for something related in my session. It's guessing. It might have been the best prior, but it guessed wrong. DuckDuckGo. It was originally a one-person effort. Uh, Gabe, uh, Gabe Weinberg, I think now it's got a handful of folks working there that they got, uh, they got funding, I think from Union Square Ventures. Uh, what do they do? They realize, I believe from looking at Wikipedia, that NLP is an ambiguous acronym. Yeah, something that anybody could have chosen to do. And then what do they do with that information? They say, hey, maybe you meant one of these. Natural language processing, nonlinear programming, which I hadn't even thought of, neurolinguistic programming. You click on one of these, you're doing the search for the right one. They've rewritten your search for you. This doesn't require you know, all sorts of crazy indexing and, and you know, custom macrogist jobs or so forth. This is really low hanging fruit. This is a so much better an experience because the ambiguity is surfaced. And this is very similar to what, you know, if somebody asked you for something and you weren't sure what they meant, you would ask the clarifying question. And someone's even gone through the effort of building, you know, massive numbers of people to build Wikipedia, which gives us a whole source of uh, you know, identifications of ambiguity. So again, you know, learning from what the librarians have been doing for a while of engaging in this sort of a dialogue. Now you want to go a step further than that. Because clarification makes sense when a query is ambiguous. But there's a difference between ambiguous and vague or broad. Just to be, uh, give an example of this, if I do a query for Nexus on Amazon, uh, maybe I mean I want a Nexus computing device, phone, tablet. I mean, there's this whole family of Nexus branded stuff. Or maybe I'm looking for sci-fi novels. I mean, that's sort of where the brand name came from anyway, although I think that's still being disputed in the, uh, in the courts. Um, the, uh, so what does Amazon do? They show the best-selling, most popular, most relevant by whatever mechanism they have devices, which in this case, you know, the tablets. They probably have a better margin on those anyway. But they recognize the ambiguity in their own way. I can't sort these by price or by bestseller or by any of the other things that Amazon lets you sort by until I've chosen a department. Amazon has all sorts of ways of refining your results. But if you look on the left, they're pretty much saying, pick a department. So look, this is a shopping site. They don't really want to get in the way of customers and spending money. But they recognize the ambiguity and make clarification very first class here. But then, this is the beauty of it. Once you clarify, they recognize that your query intent is still very broad. If I say I want a Nexus computer or a Nexus tablet, or in this case I want you know, a Nexus book, like, it's clear in both of these cases that I'm in a general category of things. You know, Sci-fi novels here and you know, mobile devices there. But I'm getting the, the mechanisms for slicing and dicing that are appropriate to that, that area. And this is kind of classic library science. In this case, I mean, for those who recognize that this is, this is faceted search, but it's kicking in once you have clarity of general intent. So the, in the first case, we're making a split between incompatible interpretations of the user's intent. And, in the set, and then afterwards, we're saying, great. We have your intent space. You probably haven't even thought about the ways in which this might be specified. So let's lay it out for you. Now, you know, faceted search, I mean, this, this goes back is the notion of, of, of uh, having different attributes and ways slicing and dicing goes back to uh, Rang and Nathan. And I think you can even argue there are earlier folks in the library science space that had all sorts of visions about uh, knowledge being broken up into these many dimensions. Uh, you know, by, by now, I think everybody's using it for e-commerce. Uh, most, most retail sites, I, mean, I had the pleasure when I was uh, at Indeca of building much of, of the company's business uh, on e-commerce sites uh, that were using it. Now I think you know, a lot of those folks are, are building uh, similar 
uh, functionality using uh, Lucene and Sol or Elasticsearch. You know, it's it's commodity there. Um, but you know, it's not just about e-commerce. There's this way of thinking about uh, about the space a space of items in terms of different ways of slicing and dicing. This is fairly universal. And you know, I wanted to give an example here of looking for people on LinkedIn. So I want to search relevant scientists. Seems like a highly specific query. Um, the, uh, but how would I choose who to put at the top? Uh, look, I, I can't share exact details, but you probably sort of surmise that you know, we're trying to do uh, all sorts of topical relevance things by catching you know, these sorts of, of uh, tokens occurring in, in fields like titles and in, um, in summaries. Uh, we're favoring people who are in my network. Uh, there are all sorts of things that are essentially either those words occur where we think they're supposed to occur or these people are related to me. But that's not necessarily the sort I want. For example, if I'm in New York, I might want to say, look, I mean, find me the ones people who are in New York. While if I'm back home, I, I, I may be more interested in people who are local to me. Now, you could say, well, great. I should just do this and have it know where I am right now. But that's silly. The machine will not, won't know all that. And so that's why you look at all sorts of ways of refining this by location, by their relationship to me, by, by company. This is further intent that can, that can be obtained. And I'd argue that for almost any search problem, you don't know your user's objective function. They might know it, but you certainly don't. So you make it sort of a best effort here. Don't embarrass yourself. Show stuff that you know. Do your best prior without any further knowledge, but you know, give them some thread in which to, to surface more. And in fact, take this as far as you can. There's, um, there's a, a guy, a professor actually of library science, Gary Marchionini, who had this Kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, polemic is the right word, but uh, essay where he advocated for what he called human computer information retrieval. The premise of that is give users control and responsibility for the process and reward them for the efforts they put in. And uh, you know, I summarize that here is like to offer users transparency, guidance, and control. Transparency to let users know what you're doing. Give them tools to interact with the experience so that they get what's going on. Uh, control, sort of the, the follow. I mean, you don't want to just see what's going on but not be able to touch the dials. And then guidance because they don't know what to ask for necessarily. And so, you know, I thought I would do a nice, very New York centric query here. So, what am I looking for? Search companies. So, companies that, that match search. But not just any companies. Companies who I know people in New York City, in the software or internet industries that are small, from 1 to 50, but get lots of people following them, over, you know, over 100 followers. And you know, I don't know if you recognize some of these. Uh, I don't know if Otis from uh, Semitex is in the house, uh, but um, you know, Pixable, a, a nice startup here. I mean, this is. A way of my finding, you know, hot startups that I know about. I think uh, Etsy's probably now exceeded the the uh, company size of 50 here, uh, but uh, I'm not going to express this in a couple of search keywords, and you're not going to guess this just by knowing something about me. This has to be something that users are able to to control. If there's any any chance of meeting the sort of information need. So you know, the, the, the takeaway here, whether you are developing the technology in a back end or building search applications, you know, li librarians made their career out of this back and forth with their customers, which is, which is a dialogue. And we should enable that in as much as possible. So before I go to the next section, any questions about that? So the, the, for the question, if you will, is that if you ask too many questions, users get annoyed. And the short answer there, which I'll go into some more detail in later, is that if I ask you for uh, a pen, say, you, know, you could theoretically say, oh, which brand do you like? Or, I, mean, I need a pen. It's pretty obvious what I need. You just give that to me. 
Um, if I ask you for money, you probably realize it's a good idea to ask you know, how much before you just answer. The, there's a bit of common sense there. Like if you use the Amazon example, they show product immediately, but they make various ways of clarification quickly available. You look at the sort of Google versus DuckDuckGo example. In DuckDuckGo's case, it recognizes that that ambiguity is likely to be what breaks things. I mean, look, at a site like LinkedIn, we're always showing search results. That might not be, always be true. I mean, at some point where if you recognize that the likelihood that you figured out what somebody wants is too low, you're better off risking annoying them with a question versus risking uh, annoying them with what looks just stupid. But that's, you know, that's a judgment call. I'll talk a bit about how to quantify that. So the question is if, if the metadata return with the result is, is part of the feedback. The, the metadata is interesting, and I think it serves two purposes. One is that the metadata is a great way to summarize what's coming back. And so for example, if you see what the most popular uh, tags, departments, depending on what sort of data it is, that gives you a pretty quick idea as to whether you're in the ballpark. Even, for example, the number of results, assuming that you're uh, you're taking the retrieval part of the equation seriously. Right? Like in web search, this is kind of the number of results is a pretty dubious indicator of anything. But on, uh, typically on an enterprise or uh, site search context, it's actually quite, quite meaningful, as are the sort of most popular facet values or other or sort of labels. The other thing in which the metadata tells you uh, is what are the interesting slices? There's actually a trade-off here in that something that tells you what everything is about is, act is a terrible way to slice it up, almost by definition. And, and so one of the things that uh, I think we need to make more of an effort to do is to say, this is a description of where you are. These are good ways uh, to slice it up. And uh, we did actually uh, some work on this we presented at a, at a conference. I'm happy to, to point you to the paper uh, later on that. So the question is, is, is right, so, so Etsy's users uh, aren't using the facets or filters that are available. Does that mean that, that uh, these users don't want to communicate? And so the, the question I would ask back there is, are the filters, based on any sort of user studies that you've done, corresponding to uh, what users would like to clarify? So as an example, if you... Um, if you make some filter that's, that's price oriented, but it turns out that your users aren't price sensitive, well then it wouldn't be surprising they don't use it. Or, or if you allow people to filter by the seller, but you've got on a typical query thousands of sellers and you re, you know, your top five sellers only represent a tiny fraction, well then it's not surprising that people won't filter by it. On the other hand, um, if when somebody looks for uh, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of a scarf. And probably it makes a difference to them whether it's a wool scarf, whether it's synthetic materials, and so forth. I would guess that that sort of thing would matter. One of the things that, and I remember uh, having some discussions with folks here about this, I don't know to what extent Etsy users are thinking, I want this kind of thing versus uh, I want to come, but I want, I have a, a look, a feel, a taste, something in mind. Maybe I'm buying a gift and I, I have the sort of the person in mind and I'll know it when I see it, but I'm better off bouncing around based on community and sort of recommendation features. Um, you know, the, in the non-unique, non-handmade world, people tend to be kind of fairly cold and objective about many of the things they buy. So it makes sense, you know, whether it's getting a car or, to be sad, sometimes even hiring people, a lot of the decisions people make are very 
metadata driven. And you see people, if you don't make these sorts of filters available, they'll actually resort to Boolean searches. Um, but it may be that the user base here is different. Etsy is, is really unique in terms of the, as far as I can tell at least, both the, the, the product and the, uh, the user base. So it's hard for me to tell how much it's a question that you're not enabling the right questions or that's just not how people who use Etsy like to find things. So the question is, uh, isn't the source of ambiguity the use of uh, the, the keywords are inherently ambiguous and if only we had context, we could do better? So there are a few things. Of course, if you know something about me, then that provides a certain degree of user context. The danger, by the way, there is that if you guess wrong, um, I can be quite annoyed uh, that, and, and you could make some very embarrassing uh, mistakes. So it might, my feeling there is imagine today, you know, you go of course it, into a store, the store provides some notion of context, or right? you go to an information repository and there's context around that. To some degree you can replicate that in a search engine by saying, well, we're going to make you answer some questions that effectively give you that context beforehand. Um, now as yeah, you pointed out earlier, if you ask too many questions for people before you provide value, that can be a problem. Also, a lot of the times, you don't need context. A lot of, a lot of queries are unambiguous. So I, I think the best practice here is that like, let people give you a search query, even if it's ambiguous. A few words is an enormous amount of information to narrow down from the world of all possibilities to what you might want. And then sort of ask for the context when you know you need it. Um, the key there is recognizing the need for it. And I'd say if you always demanded that context, then when it's unnecessary, you risk annoying your users and sending them away. If you are too clever and think you know what people want without asking them, even if your false positive rate is low, the, the, those false positives will just be really annoying. And the happy medium is you, know, you, you guess as well as you can, but you recognize uh, the ambiguity, you surface that, you kind of humbly say, look, uh, I realize you could have meant a, a, a few things. And by the way, when your probability on your best guess is low enough, you try very hard to get, uh, to get that resolved uh, before showing anything because the, the likelihood of annoying the user uh, becomes very bad. One of my, um, one of my first experiences, I think uh, you know, this was with, uh, the, now the company's kind of gone with Tower Records, was that the search there, they really didn't want to show zero results. So when a search query came in, there was this very um, aggressive query relaxation. That pretty much, if you, know, you had at least one word that matched, you'd show something. That was just a horrendous idea. Right? You'd be better off saying, look, I didn't either, we don't have it, or I didn't understand you, my spelling correction can't figure it out. Whatever it is you want to say. But this extremely, oh, we're going to put something in front of you because we're able to justify it based on some very aggressive retrieval strategy, it's, it's terrible. And you would have been better off saying, look, well, well, why don't you just call us and tell, ask us what you want. At least you wouldn't have lost the customer. I think this is a, you know, a good segue to, um, to information extraction. And the reason, like a lot of the, you know, so when it's about uh, metadata and uh, ambiguity of keywords, I mean, of course the solution is everything is, is tagged and structured and uh, data comes that way, right? Like it's all like uh, from, the, from the mouth of, meta, of, of metadata. Um, and the librarians were uh, perhaps a little bit optimistic about this because you know, in libraries you have these things called mark records and before that you had these sort of Dewey Decimal classifications. Everything's neatly, or maybe not so neatly labeled um, to the point where you could have exploration entirely in the metadata space. And it's not, it's not awful. But, um, yeah, that's not the way most of us encounter data. We're lucky 
if, if you're in a space where there is enough value, people do tend to, to curate well. So e-commerce sites are great about this. Everything has a department and a brand and so forth. Uh, the media people pay for has it. The media people don't pay for, not so much. Or uh, internets, forget it. So what can we do? And uh, you know, to your point, string matching isn't going to, to get us there. So I do a query for Ruby on LinkedIn. Do I mean people named Ruby? Do I mean you know people who work at, at Ruby Tuesday? Uh, yeah. And for what it's worth, my, my top rank results are in fact uh, people people who code in Ruby, but uh, it's not necessarily obvious. And what, what do we do with this? So the key thing I think we, we can start with is that people search for entities. And what an entity means is going to vary on context. But in LinkedIn's case, people search for people, for companies, for job titles, for skills, locations. There's a handful of things. And before even worrying about the notion of identifying these things in documents, the key is that there's actually a relatively controlled world that accounts for a very large fraction of searches. If you even in web search, entities, you actually code the, by code, I'm sorry, here I mean in the uh, uh, library science sense of, of coding, which I guess I'll accept as part of the code is craft uh, rubric. Uh, if you, uh, you know, use human judgments to evaluate queries, you'll see that a huge number of them have some kind of entity in them. So if you're working on search, you know, like, you're going to deal with entities, whether you have great entity extraction or not. And you know, so at, at LinkedIn, the first thing that happens to a query when it comes in, uh, it gets segmented and uh, I won't get sort of into the details of the string segmentation, but in this case, let's just say that like, we realize that you know, there's LinkedIn, there's CEO. We put it through some parsing, uh, and I had to have actual, actual code on a slide somewhere. So we have a hidden Markov model, uh, which is kind of old school, but quick, uh, that's assigning tags uh, to this. So ultimately, we're recognizing that you know, LinkedIn is a company, CEO is a job title. And then when we do a ranking, we're able to recognize that and, and apply it. And you know, Jeff is happy when he shows up at the top of those results. Um, and uh, the, um, you know, actually, in my view, we we're not aggressive enough here because there are a lot of results that show up that aren't so great. And depending on who's in your network, uh, he's not always at, at the top, even though uh, it's pretty clear here what the intent is. Uh, but we use this right now only for ranking, not for, for filtering. Now, named entity recognition is a commodity. Yeah, I, I don't know, show of hands, anyone who has used or is, feels reasonably familiar with one of the, at least one of the packages up here? Uh, NLTK, gate, link pipe, open NLP? Some. If you're doing entity extraction, try these. And they're all open source. Uh, link pipe, which is local. Uh, the, the two guys in Williamsburg, uh, great folks. Non-commercial uses is uh, is free. Commercial, hey, they've got to, you know, they got to pay their uh, their bills for their loft. But the, uh, uh, you know, this this stuff has been a around uh, for quite a while. And whether you're trying to find named entities like people, places, and organizations, whether you're trying to find uh, topics, you have to do a little bit more work there. But this stuff is off the shelf. But um, there's actually a problem that, that I found along the way, which surprised me, which is that the way these things tend to work is you know, a document comes in, goes to this entity detection system, gets tagged. Your next document comes in, streams, and so forth. And what's hidden in these is that these systems are typically, uh, some of them are rule-based, but a lot of them are machine learning-based. So they, they have these models. Those models are built on your data. If you actually look at the academic literature on entity extraction, it says something like this. You build a corpus of training data by taking a whole bunch of documents and labeling the beginning and end of each entity type with a corpus representative of your own. I mean, that's not that much work. Maybe you know, 10,000 documents here and there, label them. And, uh, and then 
you know, great, you can do entity extraction. Well, most people are a little bit lazy to do that. So what they end up doing is using off-the-shelf models, which are built trained on data that's not quite representative of yours. And as a result, at best, you tend to get high precision, but terrible recall. And for the non-IR people, non-information retrieval people in the house, what that means is that when you get it, what, what, these things tend to be correct, but, but you're missing most of them. And I ran into this, and I didn't really do anything with this until I got into Indeca, and it's like, oh, um, how can we fix this? It has this really simple idea that said, you know, probably if someone's a person in one document, they're a person in other documents. In fact, if, we, when, we, if when we see them, we almost always see them as one type of entity, we can extrapolate. And uh, this was kind of one of these hack your way to it solutions that I haven't seen talked about in the literature, but uh, I recommend, and particularly if you're using off the shelf entity extraction, which is grab everything that looks like an entity. And in our case, basically, uh, either single words that were capitalized but didn't begin sentences, or uh, two or more words capitalized uh, anywhere. It's a title case. Then send your documents through, have each of them grab it, but track for each entity, what, each of your candidates. Did it get picked up as an entity? And if it did, was there a majority vote? And you can do majority plurality. You can tune this based on the sort of uh, the trade-offs in your classifiers. And if there's a dominant vote, assign it. We did this with the, uh, the Enron email corpus. And suddenly, we went from having this very lossy classifier to something we could actually uh, explore. Um, you can see this as a poor, for those of you familiar with, with uh, graphical models, this is kind of a poor man's graphical model in that it's relating the, the occurrences across documents. But this is cheap. In fact, this is so cheap that you don't even need to do it to all of your documents. If something occurs often enough, you can just do it on a random sample. Now, that was what, you know, how I got my way through you know, entity extraction, named entity extraction scales. But there's this issue about what about terminology or topics. And I'd been burned by this actually when I was visualizing the relationship, seeing all sorts of uh, bad ones that had come up. But you know, at that point, I was just visualizing them. I took no responsibility for the content. So I mentioned uh, inverse document frequency a while ago. If you're looking for words that might be useful topics, then you probably would think if they're very common words, they're kind of like stop words, words, phrases, what have you. If they're very rare, well, they're not very useful as topics because they're not going to identify you know, meaningful sets of documents. They might be somebody's name or you know, some other unique word. So you want the middle. The problem is that there are a lot of things in that middle of document frequency. You might have something that's very useful as a term, like Ruby on Rails. But you might also have some word like nevertheless, which bears no topicality, but it's not that common in use. Or you know, pick your, you, you, can, you can find other words there. And that middle turns out to be necessary, but not sufficient for topicality. And the, uh, the problem is that if you resort again to hand curation, you're kind of in a bad spot. It turned out that uh, there was this, off, this paper published in 1995 that basically said you know, a good keyword is far from poisson. A little digression into stats here. A poisson process is, is a process that emits things at random where you know the average time between when you see things, but uh, you don't, roughly speaking, it's memoryless. So you're waiting for the subway. The subway comes roughly you know, every five to 10 minutes, let's call it five, but if you've waited 10 minutes, it's gonna be another five minutes. It does, you don't get any credit for waiting, which is, I know it shouldn't be how it is, but actually sometimes how it, how it feels. And you can think of the use of words in a corpus this way. Like if I use a word roughly every 200 occurrences, then I can model how it appears in the corpus this way. It turns out that words that have topical significance are kind of clumpy. So for the amount that they're used, 
they look very non-Poisson. And as a result, their inverse document frequency is significantly higher. That is, they occur in far fewer documents than would be predicted based on just the total number of occurrences that they have. And this difference between this predicted inverse document frequency and the actual one is what these guys called residual inverse document frequency. I hadn't seen anybody use this, but we plugged it in uh, at Indeca, and suddenly we had a damn good topic class, uh, topical, topicality classifier for keywords. And uh, yeah, I'm going to share the slides, so don't, don't worry about sort of catching all of this. But we took the Association for Computing Machinery, we took the keywords authors had used a bare, you know, some minimum number of times, like it was 10. We threw them all in. We filtered them by this topicality. We then uh, actually built a classifier on top of them. All this is, like I said, the, the details are in a paper. But the net result of it is we were able to amplify a very weak signal into something we could then apply our tags uh, across, the, uh, across the board and support exploratory search on top of. Um, this is kind of neat in that like, this was it kind of like taking delicious style, style data but turning this into something that you could then label all your documents with. And I think this is something that, that uh, a lot of folks are in a position to do with user generated content. What we did with ESPN was even cuter in that there were no labels. Nobody tagged documents. It's funny, with sports articles, unlike with, say, computer science articles, people aren't as interested in the sort of you know, user-generated content. But we had search logs. And you know, I said earlier, people kind of search for things that are entities in this general sense of topics. So we just went through those, played the same game, but instead of starting from the user supply tags, we just said, hey, people are searching for something that's probably good. But we did correlate it back against the, the documents we had so that you know, if people search for porn, it wouldn't show up unless, of course, there's porn on ESPN, which I don't know. Um, at LinkedIn, we've had a kind of uh, massive uh, sort of experiment here where we started, we, we have this, these LinkedIn skills, which you probably have seen if you've ever been endorsed on LinkedIn, which I'm guessing many of you have. Uh, we could talk about sort of why we, we've done design endorsements that way. But all of this started from people entering free text in this sort of specialty fields. We mined that. We de-duped it somewhat algorithmically, but we ultimately used crowdsourcing to ground this in distinct Wikipedia entries and then use co-occurrence to relate them together so you can see these related skills, in this case, for text mining. Uh, that ontology of skills, we grab that from text lying around. Now, not everybody has you know, tens of millions at this point now, hundreds of millions of documents with some labeling. But the, our starting point was very weak, very unstructured to get here. Now, the, the with, with endorsements, we managed to get a lot of people to explicitly add them to their profiles through kind of this social and viral means. But you know, you have to. People are going to look in an entity-based way, so you really want to get them. And sort of the takeaway here is that you know, entity detection is something that really matters to the way people look for things. And I hope you know the, the various techniques I've, I've presented here show this is this is very doable. This isn't something where you have to to pay some some. Uh, you know, commercial software company, monstrous amounts of money for some secret sauce. You can use off-the-shelf uh, techniques. You can recycle your logs. And then you can use your own corpus as a way of amplifying the signal that you have. Questions here before I go to the next section? So the, the question is, what about question answering systems? Aren't those the ultimate kind of communication? And, and question answering systems are neat. The, the challenge I see with them today is that they're brittle. Uh, you know, everybody got very excited about Watson and its victory in Jeopardy. Uh, and uh, one of the things that was kind of a less told part of that story is that it, 
And there's an article by Stephen Wolfram the, on the Wolfram Alpha blog that said, actually, if you did a search on any of the major search engines, you got pretty close in terms of the results appearing, at least on the first page, uh, and in many cases, in the first result or in the snippets. Um, and the problem with question answering that I see today is it really gambles hard on getting the interpretation right and giving one answer. Now that's great if your question is, you know, what's the population of New Mexico? It's not so great if you want to say, you know, what's the median age there and something misses that and perhaps or you know the maybe the designers weren't sure about the difference between mean, median, and mode. It wouldn't there are two things I see as breakdowns today. One is the the worst one is when the system doesn't understand your question and doesn't recognize that misunderstanding and gives you a number. Uh, and I've had that experience with, with uh, popular question answering based sites. The second, which is more subtle, is that I don't know as a user whether the system will be able to answer the kind of question I'll ask it. And so if I go and I, and I don't know what to, to expect in return, my frustration will be pretty high. And I think that anybody designing question answering systems has to give you a sense as to what will work. Uh, this is related to the sort of issue about context. I go into a store that sells clothing, and I'm not surprised that they don't sell books. If I go to a question answering site, I need to have a pretty good sense as to when I will have my needs met. Because if the majority of the time that doesn't happen, I would rather a less sophisticated system that was more predictable. Right. So the question is, what about things like uh, Facebook's RAP search that are entity-oriented natural language search? So I think RAP search is really exciting because it's actually, uh, there's no full text search at all, right? It's, it's the first time I've seen, other than perhaps for Quora, uh, a search experience where it is borderline impossible to search against the full text of documents. That's extremely aggressive. Um, and for certain kinds of queries, that works really well. I mean, it's, it's essentially getting you as a user to build what is kind of a SQL query out of entities using type ahead. That's awesome. However, I see a challenge there in that I don't know until I hit enter what I'm going to get. And there are all sorts of vocabulary problems that come up. So I'm a karaoke fan. When I look for people who like karaoke, that's different from people who like singing karaoke, or who like karaoke bars, or who like a particular place. Uh, friends of mine who are into beer are kind of annoyed when they find people who like Sam Adams, but different people who like beer. I, I believe Facebook is going to, to solve those problems. This is the first sort of steps to this direction. But uh, they're at a decorated expression about unlocking the poverty of your data. The moment that you move, to a highly structured experience, you realize that uh, you, 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 what you think is the metadata might not be the same as what your users think. So your users are going to want to enter entities. You have to be somewhat generous in how you understand those. Otherwise, you're going to end up giving them only a fraction of what they wanted back. And you know, it's particularly, in, I think, in the, something like graph search, recall matters a lot. Uh, okay, poor guy. So your question is, is online in the sense of, of, real, of uh, incremental or real-time construction of entities. So I mean, the, the short answer there is that you can, it all depends on your patience or latency 
versus your willingness to accept false positives. And let's say that uh, you, know, you gave the example just now of a, a new library gets released. If five people add that library, do we want to promote that as a skill? Or do we want to wait for 10, 50, 100? And particularly that one of the challenges, particularly in on LinkedIn, is that a lot of the learning is viral. The good news there is that actually in our case, when you add one of these things, your friends see it. So there's, um, there's a social mechanism for promoting it. But I'll take an example like, say, news is coming in. And uh, the, uh, you know, there was that guy uh, in, um, uh, I think it was in Ireland or in the UK, who just released 100,000 emails. Uh, and you know, perhaps nobody had heard of him. Suddenly, he's newsworthy. How do you get this person in the news within minutes? At that point, you, you probably want the human in the loop. I mean, you're going to have a whole bunch of leading indicators. If people start searching for this person. This per the, you know, noteworthy news sources are showing up with this person as an extracted name just at the document level. But the, if your trigger finger is too itchy, you'll get a lot of false positives. The best I can suggest there, this is really tricky from a, an execution perspective, is the moment you think somebody, somebody might be worth surfacing, start surfacing it. But if you can, identify your users who are most patient and have them be exposed with a mechanism for feedback. So that it's kind of like the way you could you delay somebody who might be a spammer. So that some people really want to see this right away, and other people will be really annoyed by, by bad content. If you can segment your user base so that there's this kind of slower rollout, you can get the best of both worlds. But I think that's, that's difficult to do. And uh, at some point, you've got to resort to saying, look, if the consequences of this are going to be too big, uh, y you pay people to look at them. So what you're saying is this organization like LinkedIn, let's not say LinkedIn, could be tracking the frequency of individual users' willingness to click on spots. So he's a frequent clicker. The yeah. So it's not, let me qualify it slightly differently. So imagine that, uh, actually, we can do this with show of hands. You get a call, and it says caller ID blocked. Show of hands of people who take the call. Don't worry, I won't call you. <laughs> OK, show of hands of people who send it to voicemail and then figure it out afterwards. Okay. So this is a good ratio. This is the difference between this might have been really important. I mean, look, this might have been somebody who needed to get a hold of you, borrowed someone's phone, that person blocks caller ID, and now like, it's going to cost you a few minutes uh, before you, know, you find out that, yes, you have won a million dollars or whatever it's going to be. Right? But fortunately, there are some of you who are taking the call. Now imagine the people taking the call can, in one click, say, you know, spammer. You guys would have been really annoyed had you had to wait. All the rest of you were spared because this early signal uh, is, is getting that. So I mean, if you have any way of slow, doing a slow rollout, you can get this. If, if you were undifferentiated, then some of you will have to be the early victims who, who send in that signal. But if there's a difference in people's subjective function of kind of latency versus uh, noise, you can play on that. And this, of course, only works when you can learn from it in order to, uh, to improve that. But there's a reason people do short, small A-B tests. It's kind of a similar game. Those tend to be randomized because uh, in those cases, you want representative behavior. But for some things, you could afford to take advantage of uh, different threshold functions for users. You know, when you allow people to opt into betas, and better yet, when you make your you know, premium paying customers get early access to, their, to the betas, it sounds kind of funny. It's like they're paying to be QA. But they want that. They want, they, they want that as soon as possible. They want the possibility of forming it. Everybody wins. Uh, it's not a coincidence, for example, that something like Graph Search was uh, only available to a small class of opted in users. And they knew that that might annoy people. But uh, they said, look, you signed up for it. Why, you, know, you, you want it to be annoyed. So let me do this last section now. I realize we're probably running a little bit long. Um, and uh, this is the moment of clarity. So 
I'm going to go back to, to, to you know to Google pig, Google's pigeons for a moment. Right? This is the you know this is our baseline model of what people think of a search. You know, get the what you believe are the best results, and then you show them, and hopefully people you know get what they wanted. Now, this is kind of what it looks like under the covers. You know, I worked a year at Google. I'll, I'm under some NDA there, I guess, but I'll reveal this, right? Sometimes, you know, it's like, oh, we know it's right. And sometimes they're like, um, I don't know. But what do we do? We still, for the most part, compute the results, rank them, and return them without showing this. That's not entirely true. And in fact, uh, I'll show some examples where, where, that, where that surfaced more. But you know, the problem is, for a user, now I'll pick on LinkedIn here for a moment. You know, I'm allowed to pick on, on my own team. You know, we do a search for Python developer, and these are great results. Right? People who are Python developer, job openings. You know, and by the way, if you're not a Python developer, lots of jobs. If you're looking for Python developers, there's an app for that. Um, you know, a query for startup, not so good. And you could argue that's because it's not clear what a startup is, and startups don't call themselves startups, and people that aren't startups do call themselves startups. Excuses. The point is, here we've gotten the results that, that the system should be proud of. And here we've gotten something where we should have known better, but here's what we return. Now, the question is, can the system tell the difference? And obviously, the answer I'll get to is yes, there are many ways the system can. And you, know, the, uh, you can see this difference in some sites that take advantage of it. So on the left here, this is Amazon. I do a search for a Samsung Chromebook. You'll see the results. They push that Chromebook, which I believe is their best-selling uh, laptop, actually, really front and center. Right? They make it bigger. Like This is where they expect you to click. When I do a search for a Samsung netbook, it's still the top result, but they backed off of it. They realized, look, I mean, there are a whole bunch of things I might mean. And they're not going to go as far as to say, look, we know what you meant. Now, even Amazon, I mean, just to be clear, they're, they're still showing other results. But they recognize the difference between we're really confident in what you want to we got a bunch of things that will rank them for you, even when the ranking is the same. And I mean, the uh, search is a whole bunch of different kinds of queries. There's, there's a paper by Andre Broder analyzing sort of a taxonomy of web search. And this is actually uh, more Jensen's analysis, but the notion that some searches are navigational, informational, or transactional. And I really want to sort of navigational versus a lump, particularly informational ones, under what I'll call exploratory. So this was designed, this taxonomy was designed for web search, but I'd make a distinction between a navigational query typically being there's one thing I'm looking for. Either you find it and I'm happy, or you didn't find it and I'm not, end of story. And an exploratory query, you typically have a set of things that you'd like to hone in on. And once you get that set, we'll figure out what to do with it. If you confuse those two, things get messy. But this is part of the problem with, 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 with ranking as a metaphor. If you just score everything and rank it, there's no distinction available between sort of what should have been the, you know, the I feel lucky, there's one thing, and let's get it, versus there's a set of things I'd like to enable exploration for. The question is, can we identify these? You know, going back to a query, we can. I mean, we can the, the query analysis is a great place in which we can say, look, this, this is the sort of query that is navigational. We know that uh, when people do these sorts of queries, there's one result they're looking for. Um, and so we can do this with query analysis. We can analyze user behavior. When people do a search for Apple on LinkedIn, you can make all sorts of arguments of what they might be looking for. But we see the clicks. And we see, actually, they predominantly click on you know, the company named Apple. So we push that. And we're not as aggressive as Amazon about the way it's distinguished, but even though we're returning people, we're returning jobs, but we say, look, let's, let's put the company there because we know from, from behavior that's what people mean. And you can do this through scoring as well. It's a little bit idealized, but you know, when somebody when a query is navigational and you get it right, you know, this is what you want things to look like. You've got one result that 
you know, sort of dominates in your scoring, and everything else is worse. This isn't going to happen for all your navigational queries, but if you know from query analysis that it looks navigational, and you see this, this difference in scoring, you're pretty hopeful at that point. In contrast, if you believe your query is exploratory, you want this. You want to picture where, act, where relevance is, you know, ideally, it's uniform across. But perhaps it's a step function right, with a slightly sliding, because there's always going to be some kind of sorting. But if this drop off is dramatic, that doesn't seem very exploratory. The notion here is that, that there isn't that much of a difference in the relevance of these. It's probably more about what we don't know of the information need. Now, there are many ways in which you can compute the, how well the system did. And uh, you know, if this is something that you work on, if, if, you, if you work on, uh, on any aspect of search experience, if you can brave the math, the book is worth it. This is David Carl, Carmel and Yelad Yontov's sort of monograph on this. Uh, you know, 20 bucks really well spent. Uh, I, don't, I don't get a commission on it. Um, if you want to sort of see what's out there, Claudia Howe wrote a dissertation on query difficulty uh, that covers a lot of it. And I'll just go, you know, so you can, before you retrieve documents, there are all sorts of features you can play with. You can look for specific query terms, which are typically of high IDF. Uh, you can know that a query term is ambiguous based on sort of the relative entropy of the collection. Uh, you can look for terms in the query. Are they related to one another? Lots more. The nice thing about these, those predictors, they're cheap. They're not only great, but you can do them before you've invested in retrieval. Post-retrieval, there's all sorts of things you can do by looking at the kinds of results that came back. You can say, you know, are they kind of, are they coherent? When you look at them as a collection, are they distinctive from the baseline collection? And uh, this is actually, there's a measure called query clarity that folks at UMass worked on. Um, you could also look at the sensitivity of the ranking. It's one of my favorite ones. You basically, you kind of kick the retrieval function a bit. You kick the ranking function and you say, well, how sensitive is it? And if it's really sensitive, if some slight tweaks get you a completely different ranking, you're probably, you screwed up in the first place. Because the, uh, if you think about it, none of, your, none of your signals are all that precise. And if they're highly sensitive, that's a sign that they're wrong. And then of course, finally, you could, if you have historical data, you can look at queries, that, queries how they've been clicked. But these happen to work nicely for, for new queries as well. You know, the takeaway here is that you know, queries do vary in difficulty. And there are various ways you can use to recognize that. And then you can make the, the experience adapt to that. Um, and that way, in particular, you ask, the, you ask the user's questions when you need to. So just, so this is the last section. I'll do a review and then and help for questions at the very end. You know, act like a librarian and communicate with your user. Yeah. The, use the available technology for entity detection and then rely, you know, use your corpus to bootstrap that. And finally, you know, recognize that there's this heterogeneity of query difficulty. Grab the signals. Use that to make the experience adapt to it. And you know, these are great textbooks. If you're working in the field, uh, you should probably have both of them. Certainly take advantage of what the last few decades have accomplished in this. But recognize that the retrieval and ranking are only part of the equation. The dialogue is really where it's at. And you know, communicate with your users. And of course, a word from our sponsors. Uh, that number is off by a little bit. Thank you. Talking about Wolfram. I really want that site to be better. <laughs> I really believe in what you're doing, but I, this isn't like I tried to compare um, gunshot deaths to automotive automotive mm -hmm. deaths. I couldn't I couldn't get that out of it. Yeah. So uh, I wrote a blog post about Wolfram before I joined LinkedIn, so I, I can refer to that uh, while studying politics. I think what, 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 what World Firm has done is amazing. In fact, uh, I don't know how many folks have, have you know, I, I think the sort of geek crowd used it a lot. And then Siri exposed that uh, to the world. And it's 
I know people who love it actually just for doing, the, doing math on it. Uh, so I remember at some point doing things like comparing revenue per employee at different sorts of companies. It's great. The problem, uh, as might have been evident from when I said it before about when question answering systems are brittle, is that it's a great system when you have a structured question as input. It's a very um, unpredictable system when you enter natural language. And it breaks down typically by taking your question, doing some interpretation, and then you have to really squint at it to figure out whether it got your intent right. So when it came out, I, I talked to folks there and I said, could you, could you make this more of an API? And I don't mean an API saying so that I can send text to it and get something back. I mean, can you help people with query construction? And they're like, no, no, it's natural language. I'm like, that's, that's not what you've achieved here. The amazing thing what you achieved is collecting all this data in, in this kind of structured form to enable it so that I could, for example, in a spreadsheet, add a column that's derived. But um, they're clearly into natural language. The integration with Siri has kind of taken a step in that direction. I wish them well, but I, I do think that there's something inherent about question answering that's brittle. And that's one of the reasons that people engage in this as a dialogue, recognize their limits, and typically by the only answer questions in their areas of expertise, unless they're, of course, thought leaders. <laughs> oh, hi. So the question is, 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 what about the conversation for finding images? So I know from personal experience, and I, I, I don't take all these photos myself, and I rely very heavily on, uh, on the way that Google Images allows everything from honing in on clip art to picking sizes of images. Uh, and one of the more fun features that they really have underplayed is uh, what they call search by subject, where they're attempting to, uh, to grab that. Um, I think you know, one of the challenges, obviously, with images, there'd be a question like, is the metadata available to do this? But if you think about it, the mere fact that those images are findable through text suggests that you, you do have a lot uh, to play with there. The more interesting question, I guess, is when people are coming in looking for images, what are their needs? For example, in, in, if they're coming into a uh, more of like a digital asset management, they might care about how much they're going to have to pay, what are the licensing rights, and so forth. If they're looking for an image for a presentation, they might want to say, you know, is it safe for work? Is it you know, colorful? What, what are the sizes? I don't know for Shutterstock users, what are the, you know, if people were engaged with, with a person trying to help them find an image, what would that dialogue be like? But I believe it would not be as simple as find me a picture of a cat. And they'd say, here you are. It'd be you know, like, uh, th there'd be all sorts of, of, of facets available. Now, the question is first, uh, can, you, can you surface that in a way that people see it? And then, of course, do you have the, sort of the, the information extraction necessary to do that? There are a lot of things that you can do, even in cases where you know, there are people who do this without text, where they just cluster by image similarity and uh, use surrogates as sort of examples of what something's like. Uh, the, uh, I do believe that you have to enable something because the initial information need is underspecified. Something you do is going to get that specified. And to me, that's a conversation of sorts. So the question is, is mobile search different from web search? You know, unmistakably, the uh, the form factor for many people still the, the latency uh, of doing that uh, changes things. I think that the interesting thing with mobile search is that uh, you have context. Right? A lot of, of mobile uh, search still has sort of location as a key feature, which you can use uh, to your benefit, or even uh, uh, other kinds of context. For example, LinkedIn, 
know, a very typical instance of, of mobile search, at least on the phone, is you walk into a meeting and you see someone and uh, you want to know more about them. Uh, if you're engaged in, in something that's going to take an hour, you're probably not going to do that uh, on even the best of uh, sort of your, your phablet or what have you. So there are a bunch of things about mobile that, on one hand, raise challenges in terms of the, the bandwidth of the interface, and on the other hand, hopefully give you uh, some context either in terms of literally placing the user or um, uh, sort of what we know about, about their behavior. One of the promises I see in mobile is that it, the more that you're using a device everywhere that you go, the more that device could know about you and help you. I mean, I think th now that, um, and it's going to be interesting in terms of the, the various people who'd love to control that gateway. But it's kind of no excuse for my phone not to know a huge amount about me and use that to, to give contextual hints uh, to anything that I do. Uh, but we, you know, we're seeing that. Certainly things like Google Now are going in that direction. I expect some, you know, Apple to take similar steps, and we'll, we'll see. But uh, perhaps the most important thing about mobile is like, typing sucks. So you kind of want to do everything you can there to uh, reduce the need for typing. Uh, yeah. Uh, either. So the question is, how, how much can you do with, with auto suggestion? So I mean, there, there you can learn from, from what people have done with spelling correction, right? Which is that when I think you spelled it, the query correctly, I just return the results. When I am very sure that I know what you were trying to spell, I tell you, maybe I even, don't even tell you, but hopefully I'm transparent and I tell you, I've automatically returned results for something else. Or typically, I'm including results for something else. And when I am pretty sure, but not entirely sure. I show you results for your original query, and I say, did you mean? I think there's something similar there where you have to calibrate the confidence in this. Because if you return results that you automatic, automatically include, thinking, I'm going to see the user a step by showing them something I think they meant, you know, the, on one hand, you don't want to be sort of stupidly literal and say, ah, you didn't type that exactly, I'm not going to show it. But your false positive cost is very high. And uh, there's kind of, you need to sort of calibrate along the spectrum between um, uh, the cost of, of embarrassing yourself versus the extra effort a user will have to make. And by the way, a single click, not so bad. Maybe you know, one step of latency. Uh, perhaps the most important thing, whether it's through a type ahead interface or through suggestions presented, is making it a click rather than typing in full queries. So, Kellen, you had a question. Yeah, well, I have a question. On, on mobile, we have the machine data data, but you can compare the machine data data to the query. Because other people can browse the browser, but it's less than there. Yes, so to read the comment, you know, mobile is largely navigational. I mean, so we see a lot of that ourselves. I mean, but I think part of that is, is it's hard to tell. One of the dangers of all this is that. If you optimize for navigational queries, you'll get navigational queries. And you can get into positive feedback loops with, with uh, the log analysis. But uh, I mean, I think part of it with, with browsing is that if people, uh, particularly working on something like faceted search, got spoiled with this whole, like, oh, we'll put in the left rail. Okay, like your left rail is your screen in mobile. You can't do that. And at that point, You've got to be much more judicious about the choices you offer users uh, and when you offer them. Uh, I, I think it's still an open problem as to uh, implementing this kind of, of conversational approach when you have that, that tiny a form factor. Uh, you're seeing that, though, even with even literal conversation with something like Siri maintaining state. We're going to get there, but we're not there yet. And I think people right now are still excited enough that, you know, you know, vanilla search works pretty well, especially when you add the context there. So it's just behind. People aren't demanding it yet. Other questions?
Yeah, so the question is, do, do, you, do you do clarification before or after? So one of the reasons, for example, that uh, we're showing uh, jobs and people early on is that we don't know. Right? We, we, we're, we're quite sure it's one of those, but um, and uh, we also know like it's not going to be in companies, right? It'll be one of them, but uh, the uh, it's there are a bunch of considerations going on there. One is that for people to act to use those drop downs, for many people that, that means, for example, they're touch typing or they're hesitating before they enter. Right? If I'm just typing in and I hit enter, I won't see them. So we have to at least make that experience positive. This is something that Google ran into when it did uh, uh, all the sort of instant, like the, the pattern that if I type a query, hit enter, it's kind of no matter what was going on in the background, that experience has to be consistent with what would have happened had you not, uh, not seen anything. The auto suggest, you know, I actually feel like we could make it a bit less cluttered. Uh, on LinkedIn right now, right? We have all sorts of instant results, which are taking you to specific entities, very often people, but also companies and skills and groups, and also suggested searches uh, that you may not have seen those, but that, that's uh, what you're seeing in the, the example there, where it's really doing. You, when you when you click it, you get to a search, and the um, we I, I don't have I don't have a great answer there. There there there. Are, Meetings are to different needs. I'd say that if somebody has typed in a couple of characters and you can figure out everything else they need with high probability, you know, be nice to them. Don't, don't make them type in the rest. And that's, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, without going all cliffy on them, you, you can teach them that, like, hey, you know, you, and by the way, in mobile, the problem is, in mobile, this is really great, right? Because you type, you're typing in very slowly. In fact, the, the LinkedIn on mobile, it, type ahead is almost the entirety of the experience because of that. As we know, people, people hate typing in, in, in that environment. And the typing is slow enough that uh, during that brief time between you know, when you can find where your next character is, we've probably gotten you there. Uh, very different from in a, uh, a desktop environment where you actually there's a decent chance that your typing will be fast enough that uh, you won't notice uh, when the next queries have happened. But um, you know, it also depends on really how quickly you can reduce the uh, Sort of the intent entropy, like how many, how many possibilities are there? You don't gain much by showing very low probability things early. But the moment you have something that's, you know, say one in 10 of being right, or maybe in a collection, one in three, one in four, uh, that's worth it, right? If, if, a bunch, if, if a quarter of your users are going to save 10 keystrokes, why not? Particularly that if you catch them then, rather than before they made a typo, it's kind of nice. Uh, so um, I don't see any harm in making it available sooner, but you, gotta, you have to accept that uh, for a large fraction of your users, they, they won't use it, and that's OK. Um, have you guys or anyone else done any experimentation with uh, promoting specific fashion categories based on the content of the query? So the question is, is promote specific facet categories uh, based on the context. Uh, and at LinkedIn, we've analyzed facet use. And the ordering that you see uh, is globally optimized, but not locally optimized. And there's a trade-off there, and it's a tough one. On one hand, we know for certain classes of queries that some facets are going to be of more value. On the other hand, you as a user know where things are. And it's, if you're going to use the facets, it's not that hard to scroll. We, you know, if, if, uh, the, the recruiter product actually has a lot more sort of bells and whistles that way, but it also has more kind of dedicated power users. If we start moving things around, there is a cost to the predictability for the user. And I mean, you can imagine that users will develop a muscle memory that for certain kinds of queries, the facets are in certain places. But this is pretty tricky. And I think that uh, it's better if, if, you're, if your users are going to incur a cognitive cost for your cleverness, uh, score that pretty high relative to the milliseconds that they'll benefit from. But perhaps the exception to that being if there is some clarifying question worth getting there just to get the user in the right place, 
you're better off not just ordering that at the top, but like, you're even putting it front and center if you could. Because it's at, at that point, you want to disrupt the user's experience and push something on them. We're not doing that at LinkedIn right now. I think I've gone a little bit over, but I'll be sticking around. So thank you again. And thanks especially to Kellen and to Etsy for hosting.